stoves, but the bear stays up. Bear giggles and grins, he works and he wraps, he bustles and bakes while everyone naps. He piles up presents under the tree, but who's at the doorway Bear doesn't see. He toils all night until the sun rises, making his friends their Christmas surprises. Just before dawn, he lets out a yawn, but he still stays up. Can you guys see who's visiting the lair? When Christmas arrives so lovely and white, Bear's friends awake to a glorious sight. Presents and goodies are piled up tall. I stayed up, says Bear, just to share with you all. Look at all of those treats he put under the tree. As his friends shout with glee, Bear rides by the tree, but he still stays up. Rin flies to the stockings and tweets out a cheer. Besides our bear's present, Santa was here. When all the gifts are opened, there's one last surprise. Badger shows bear a quilt just his size. Bear snuggles up tight and mutters goodnight. Then bear falls asleep. He finally gets to fall asleep, doesn't he? Because what do bears do in the wintertime? Does anyone know? Yeah, they hibernate. His friends tidy up and slip from the lair. They whisper sweet dreams. Merry Christmas, dear bear. So what was bear doing when he was working so hard into the night? Yeah. That's right. He was wrapping presents and making treats for his friends. And did his friends do nice things for bear too? Did they put up a Christmas tree together and decorate it? Maybe that's something we've done at our house too, right? So the key in this book is that they all give, right? And that's part of how we can prepare our hearts for Christmas. We can give. Now, one of your crafts this evening is going to be to make an Advent chain. Have any of you ever made an Advent chain before? Just raise your hands if you've made one. So the idea is, for every day leading up to Christmas, there is a link. And after the day is done, you tear off the link. But this Advent chain is very special because it actually tells you a way that you can give to someone else for each day leading up to Christmas. And there should be eight links on your chain. So we have leave a compliment note wherever you go. I saw one about chores, which I think is really good, making sure you do your chores. But these are friendly reminders of ways that we can prepare our hearts for Jesus' coming, for his birth in the manger, by caring for those around us, and by making a difference through ways that we can give. So let's bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for the season of Advent. In the season of waiting, we ask that you indeed would prepare our hearts I ask that you equip every child here with a heart to make a difference and to drink in your love and your grace represented at Christmas time, increasingly each day. It's in Christ's sweet name that we pray. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.
wise pastor once told me that we are an Advent people. And I had never really thought about that as a child. I knew that Advent was a season marked by waiting because I remember going into the sanctuary and seeing the wreaths that were progressively lit with candlelight. And I remember my own journey at home with those cute little candy calendars that you open day by day leading up to Christmas and get a little special treat each day you opened it. But to be honest, when I was little, I just wanted to get through Advent. I wanted to get to Christmas. I wanted to unwrap those presents. I wanted to taste the cookies. I wanted to get together with my family. But as I've grown, I've learned to appreciate the importance of Advent's waiting. We are journeying as a people to celebrate the day that Christ was born. And this is not only a birth that happened long ago, this is a birth that can happen again in our very hearts. And just as Mary and Joseph intentionally prepared for baby Jesus, who was born in a manger, Scripture asks us to prepare for his birth as well. In my mind, the promise of Christmas has everything to do with the belief in the culmination and the fulfillment of the continued promises of Scripture in our daily lives. In other words, Christmas as a culmination of our waiting is a celebration that God can be trusted, that God can and will act, and that you and I can continue to be the beneficiaries of and the partners in God's work. The reality is, I think we all need that reminder, and not only at Christmas, but every day. You know, we live in a broken world, and as we journey in this broken world, there's really not a time that we aren't waiting for some promise of God to take fulfillment in our lives. We're waiting. Whether we're yearning for God to act on a wider scale to rectify social injustice, provide for the needy, or elevate the forgotten, we serve others. We show up and we wait. Or whether we're frustrated in our own lives by broken relationships or personal provision or faltering belief, we pray, we show up, and we wait. When we're spiritual people, we are a waiting people. We're waiting for God to do once again what only God can do. And I'm convinced that that even goes a step further to say that when we become closer and closer to the heart of God, then our yearning and the depth of our waiting increases. So, we're an Advent people, and tonight I'm going to explore how the biblical story of Advent can provide us with some necessary guidance and some needed encouragement on our journeys. And to begin, it's really, really important to understand that Jesus' birth broke into a world that was hurting and broken. I'm amazed that pregnant Mary, when she anticipates the birth of the Christ child, sings these words. The Lord has shown his strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Friends, Mary would not be praising these social reversals if these social reversals were not desperately needed in her time. 
The Christ child came into a world that needed a savior, and this is just as true today. As painful or as trying as the circumstances in our own lives might be, they are not outside the banner of why Christ came to earth in the first place. That means that the message of Christ's birth is breaking into our world of uncertain tax plans and terrorist threats. It's breaking into our world of cancer diagnoses and loss in stories of wide-scale abuse unfurling in our film industry. The Christmas message is for us. You see, the acknowledgement of our hurting world is also an acknowledgement of our waiting, for things are not quite right, and our Savior wants to help. To welcome our Savior, we need to be faithful in our waiting. And, you know, the Bible acknowledges that this is not an easy principle. When we rewind and look at the choice that Mary actually had to make in order to bring the Christ child into the world, we can totally get that. Because the reality was, being an unwed mother opened her up to social derision, financial uncertainty, and social insecurity. And I'm really fond of a poem that talks all about that by seeking to portray her perspective on the narrative that unfurls in scripture. And this is how the poem Mary Pondering reads. What is the seed which God has planted unasked, uncompromised, unseen, unknown to everyone but angels, this gift has been? And who am I to be the mother to give my womb at heaven's behest and let my body be the hospice and God the guest? Oh, what a risk in such a nation, in such a place at such a time, to come to people in transition and yet in prime. What if the world for spite ignores him and friends keep back and parents scorn in the fear of every woman in me is born? Still I want to love and hold him. His cry, applaud, or his cry attend, his smile applaud. I'll mother him as any mortal and just like God. Mary knows that the end promise of the Christ child is sweet. She is convicted to play her part in our salvation story, but she is absolutely aware of the risks that are involved in doing so. So if we go back even further, I'm convinced that there's wisdom for us in the Old Testament, because there, too, were people waiting for a promise. God had promised to deliver the Israelites out of slavery and into the promised land. Yet journey to the promised land was a long and arduous one through the wilderness. And scripture tells us that the weight of that journey weighed heavily upon their hearts. In the end, instead of remaining faithful and accepting the challenge, they faltered by complaining and worshiping false idols. And as a result, they did not see the promised land in the generation that journey. It was in fact the next generation, their children, who actually entered because God was still faithful. But I wonder as we're waiting for promises to be fulfilled in our own lives, if we can relate to the challenge of remaining faithful, despite the risks like Mary, or despite the hardship like the Israelites. Just like the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, I wonder if your waiting feels like a wilderness of sorts too. I wonder if it feels like you're wandering, yearning, 
without the promised destination firmly in sight. And friends, that can look like a promise that is close to your heart that has not yet been fulfilled. And you ache and you wonder how it can possibly happen. That is your wilderness right now. And make no mistake that just like the Israelites, we will be tempted in that wilderness. And we will be tested in that wilderness. It's so easy to relate to the Israelites' temptation to complain and grumble. It's so tempting to reach for a quick fix, a shortcut answer like a false god, instead of entrusting our concerns to God and taking the hard action. I mean, I can relate to that. But God is meeting us in our wilderness this Christmas. Just as the voice of John the Baptist shouting in the wilderness to prepare hearts for the coming of the Christ child, God is doing that now. God is meeting us and asking us to prepare our hearts for the coming birth. And this preparation goes well beyond the typical consuming activities that accompany our holiday festivities. The wrapping, the card sending, the present buying. Instead, it has to do with decluttering rather than cluttering and turning inward rather than outward. It has to do with the heart. Preparing our hearts means making them ready to receive the promises of Scripture anew. It means being willing to chance a childlike faith as we remember the strength that came from a tiny baby all those years ago that still is changing history now. It means having a firm resolve despite the risks, like Mary. After all, Mary is praised in scripture for her faithfulness. She is remembered for saying, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. What I don't want you to miss is that her faithfulness wasn't blind, but it was resolved. And she chose obeying God first. And friends, we're called to be faithful ourselves today. And that too must include exercising a firm resolve in order to reap the full measures of the promises of God. And I just love this quote that talks about how exactly we can do that. Because scripture's very hope, for instance, is something that we must actively choose. This is what one theologian says. Choosing to choose can seem awkward and redundant. But it may be a necessary first step in the search for a genuine hope. This is not splitting hairs or playing word games. Choosing to choose is different than merely choosing. It evokes a sturdy intention, flexes against doubt and resistance, hones resilience, and sends down hardy roots. It has stamina and longevity, Poised for a long-distance run, it is resolute and determined. Merely choosing can be unreflective and impulsive, while choosing to choose is reasoned and measured. We have the opportunity to choose the hope of Christmas today. We are invited to send down our own hearty roots, despite the challenges that may, go, may be going on within or around us. Pregnant Mary sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This is not a flippant song. It's a song of immense spiritual depth and resolve. And it's a song that I think is so fitting for our own preparation as we await the coming of the Christ child. We are an Advent people. 
The story of Advent is not only about what happened long ago, it encapsulates our waiting and our grappling now and calls us to faithfulness. But in its very definition, it also gives us the opportunity to choose to choose genuine hope. The best metaphor that I can use to describe this sermon is this. Christmas is like a welcome, fresh rainfall in the tired, dusty sands of our wilderness. And scripture says, rain is coming. My hope is that we not only feel its refreshment, but we splash it onto others. Amen.
A long time ago, the angel Gabriel came to a young girl named Mary with a message from God. He told her, the Lord is with you. Mary was frightened to be face to face with an angel and to hear him speak to her. The angel Gabriel then said, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You are going to have a son and give him the name Jesus. People will call him son of the most high and there will be no end to his kingdom. Mary, full of questions, asked the angel how this could be happening to her. Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will come to you and the power of God will come over you. Therefore, your child will be holy and will be called the Son of God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant, so let it be with me, just as you have said. And then the angel disappeared. About 2,000 years ago, the Roman Emperor Augustus called for all the people in his kingdom to go to the towns where they were born so they could count how many people lived in the kingdom. Mary and her soon-to-be husband Joseph headed out to Bethlehem, the town of his birth. It was a long, hard journey, especially since Mary was about to have a baby. When they finally arrived in Bethlehem, Joseph had to find a place for them to sleep for the night. Joseph went from door to door, but there were no empty rooms in Bethlehem that night. Finally, one innkeeper offered his stable, a place where animals sleep on straw to stay warm during the cold desert nights. This is where he brought Mary for shelter, which was good since the baby was going to be born very soon. In the fields surrounding Bethlehem, there were shepherds guarding their flocks at night. An angel came to them, and the glory of the Lord shined all around them. The shepherds were afraid, but the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I am here to bring you good news. This news will bring joy to all people. Today in the city of Bethlehem, a Savior was born. He is the Messiah. You will find him wrapped in bags of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, the sky above the fields was filled with angels, and they were all praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said, Let us go to Bethlehem now and see what this is all about. The shepherds rushed into Bethlehem. After Jesus was born, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They had been watching the sky and noticed that stars were acting in a strange way. That meant something very special had happened. The wise men heard that the Jewish people had been waiting for a long time for the Messiah, a special person to save them from harm. So they wondered, where is this child who has been born King of the Jews? We have followed his star and have come to worship him. The star led them to a stable in Bethlehem. The wise men were overwhelmed with joy when they found the baby Jesus. They knelt down and worshiped the baby who was lying in a manger. They gave him very expensive gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were gifts given only to a king. Many came to see the newborn king, the shepherds, the angels, the young and the old. They all came and rejoiced in him. Our Christmas story ends here, but the story of Jesus has no ending.
Noel told us the promise of a life with God, that even in the places where our lives are broken, that God finds God's self, God's way, into those places, bringing us peace and healing. When our Lord Jesus came into the world as a little infant child, Jesus came to be with us, to walk in the neighborhood, to be with us in our brokenness, to be with us in our joy. And just as God taught, taught the disciples, taught the people, even now, Jesus whispers into our hearts and teaches us through these good words. And just as Jesus ate with sinners, so we, even us, are invited to the table of blessing. Friends in Christ, as we come together to share this bread and this cup, we come with Christ's invitation. We come with angels and archangels. We come with our broken sisters and brothers. And we remember that God is with us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread just like this. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Because this is my body, which is for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and after thanking God, he said, This cup means that all of your sins are forgiven in Christ. This is the new promise, that God's grace is for you always, that I will be with you even to the ends of the earth. Sisters and brothers in Christ, you've heard the beautiful story of Mary, afraid. Mary, facing a world that was broken, who knew that when God was with her, she could be brave. When God was with her, she could do anything. Let us be nurtured on this food, this bread, and this cup, and remember those same things again. Fed with the spiritual food of our faith, we this cup and this bread. Firm in Christ with God with us. There's nothing that we can't do. Faced with the brokenness of the world, let us remember that we belong to God, and that with God's calling and God's presence in our life, that we can not only live a blessed life, but spread that blessing to others, leaving that splash behind as we go. May it be so. Amen. Yeah.
Resting and gentle wind.